be sure your short-term mission is in a long-term context and in a long-term perspective. You know, just like any Sunday service you do, hopefully, a vision behind it. So whatever you're teaching this Sunday fits into where you want your church to be in a year or two years. Uh, so similar with short-term mission. You know, whatever you do in short-term ought to fit into some long-term plan for those who are going to be there long after you've come back home again. Radstock exists to equip and engage local churches to start new local churches in the world's toughest places. Find out more at radstock.org. So welcome to the latest edition of the Radstock Missions podcast. Uh, my name is Steve Palferman. Hi, I'm Brian Jones. Well, Brian, it's great to have you join me this afternoon or this morning where you are. Um, and I thought we'd talk about short-term teams. Uh, so what what makes a good short-term team? What is a short-term team? Are they valuable in the work of global missions? What should we, should we not do uh, in regards to short-term teams? So I want to pick your brains on those areas. So let's start perhaps with a definition. What is a short-term team, a short-term missions team? Yeah, well, these days, it's uh, probably anything from sort of two weeks to two months, I suppose, fits in with uh, summer holidays for students, things like that. Uh, back in my day, 1979, the short term mission was explicitly, in my case, eight months training, two years overseas. But uh, these days, I think people tend to think in much shorter terms than that. And uh, typically a group sent to a place to do a specific task. I guess those are sort of the characteristics of short term teams. Um, I... Uh... We were talking earlier just about whether a short-term teams, in some ways, different reasons for different kinds of teams. So some short-term teams will be focused on a particular project, others focused on the people going. You know, is it helpful to make some of those accommodations in our definition? Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 you know, I think the important thing is always to think this is about doing mission, isn't it? And so therefore, you know, we want to make sure there's a missional focus in it. And, uh, you know, sometimes pastors, because they are pastors and concerned about discipleship of their own people, can uh, can think, well, it'll be great for our church. And it will be great for your church. It'll be fantastic for your church. But uh, that's that shouldn't be the sort of shaping uh, principle. Yeah. So I always say to people, link up with the host church there and find out, you know, what it is they want, find out what it is they think uh, you can do to add to their effectiveness in spreading the gospel or, or make disciples uh, where they are yeah. and then fit into their long-term vision for their own ministry at that end. So sometimes yeah. that could be a practical thing, uh, building something, or sometimes it can be uh, an evangelistic initiative. Uh, sometimes it could just be a foreign presence, an English week or something like that, which draws a crowd and, uh, and gives you a chance to uh, meet people and gives them a chance to engage long-term with people. Yeah. You said that really quickly, but I think that's really important, isn't it? The the emphasis on serving the purpose of mission, so serving the people who we're going to spend time with, is is right at the heart of what we uh, we want behind a good. Well, I well, I just probably people get sick of hearing me tell them when I coach them a bit is uh, be sure your short term mission is in a long term context and in a long term perspective, and uh, and so it's fitting in. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, just like any Sunday service you do, hopefully, is uh, got a long-term, uh, you know, vision behind it. So whatever you're teaching this Sunday fits into where you want your church to be in a year or two years or five years. Uh, so similar with short-term mission, you know, whatever you do in short-term ought to fit into some long-term plan for those who are uh, going to be there long after you've come back home again. Yeah, yeah. Um, so let's go for... Good reasons to do a short-term team, then. Let's see whether we can list as many as we can. Uh, good reasons to do short-term mission teams. Go for it, Pastor. Uh, okay. Because a mission partner has asked you to come and help do something particular, which is just re-saying what you said. Um, because we're concerned for long-term global partnerships, and often those are built through short-term teams, so it it helps build long-term global links into our churches. Uh, other good reasons. Um, 
they can be uh, sometimes, to, especially if you spend some people who are really influencers and trusted, they can be ways your church discovers uh, a long-term global direction, actually. I've seen that happen uh, even in my own churches back in the UK in the past. We'd send teams to Cambodia, to China, and out of that long-term ministries that have gone on for 20 years, sometimes sending long-term missionaries, sometimes just a series of ongoing short-term teams over many years developed. But the vision emerged through sending short-term teams, yeah. um, and but with people who had come back and were trusted by the leaders to uh, to give guidance to the church. Yeah, yeah. Um, they are great. They're great for discipling uh, your people. Uh, my little favorite story about that is a little mountain church in Albania that hosted short-term teams for many years from a British church. The pastor told me they don't really help us that much with evangelism, but it's our way to help disciple British young people by he- hosting them. And I, I love that, actually. Uh, but it was a mutually understood uh, goal. So um, in that case, it's a fantastic way for uh, a foreign church to help you dis- in your discipleship, as long as they understand that's part of part of the deal. You know, yeah. So yeah. they for sure help in your discipleship, your people. By the way, sometimes timid evangelists at home Blossom overseas, they're not going to be recognized. They don't sort of have the local sort of hangups of being in their own town or whatever. And they can think, hey, they can go back saying, I know how to share the gospel. I did it over there, wherever over there is, and, and can actually set some people really free. So I don't always subscribe to the idea that if they're not doing it at home, you can't send them over there. I understand the, the thinking behind that. Mm-hmm. But I think sometimes people just become free uh, uh, by being in another context. Yeah. I, I wonder whether the other thing, just um, looking at the New Testament, there's so many short-term trips going on between churches and mission partners and Paul's missionary teams. And and the way that he talks, particularly in 1 Thessalonians, about his own encouragement and joy in the Christian faith being tied up with first-hand news of what's going on in other parts of the, the world. I, I just think that the mutual encouragement and joy in the Christian life that comes from connecting with what's going on in other places is um, is an important yeah. part of uh, short-term teams. Yeah, one of the Radstock pastors actually um, in America, he goes to Albania and he told me, I always go at the worst month of the year, especially back in the old days when the infrastructure there was really, uh, you know, underdeveloped. He'd say, I just want to show up in February and sit there and be cold with these guys because I want them to know uh, they are not forgotten. And I thought, you know, there's a lot of wisdom in that, just the power of encouragement. Yeah. And short-term teams can really do that to churches that are in difficult places, you know, persecuted churches or churches where there's very few believers yeah. around them, very few little local fellowship. A short-term team can be a great boost. And uh, I think in the West where we have lots of churches, lots of Christians, lots of conferences, uh, we can forget how powerful that kind of encouragement is to uh, people in other contexts. So it's, that's a really important point you make. Yeah. Yeah. I think we've found as well as a church who are trying to build long-term links with different churches in other parts of the world, that the short-term team or the short-term visit uh, can really help build relationships, which encourage prayer at this end and, the other end, so it's been encouraging to have churches that we partner with in Kosovo praying for sick members of our church family and because they've met them and they know them. And, you know, so that kind of relational building is really important part of short term teams. Yeah. Uh, and again, on both directions, it helps develop the mission vision of uh, the church yeah. you're going to as well, because uh, many times those churches can be sort of in the mode of of receiving and perhaps, you know, feeling like they have not much to give. But uh, when they see you need prayer, when you tell them you need prayer, when you uh, make it clear that you uh, need them as well, that's that really helps them think about their mission uh, vision. Are short-term teams a good way of identifying long-term workers as well? Once for me, that's uh, that's my story. I went as an 18-year-old to Mexico for uh, 10 days, 46 hours on a, an American school bus sort of thing. And uh, came back and told my parents, uh, I'm going to be a missionary and uh, uh, sort of freaked them out, uh, <laughs> sort of freaked me out. But um, it's true. So, yeah, and I, I've seen that over and over and over again. So it's a great way to, um, to 
sow that seed. Or if someone's <clears throat> interested in uh, and has expressed an interest, you know, a great way just as a test, as a step, as a stepping stone for you as a church uh, leadership to uh, to assess and help them understand their calling perhaps a bit uh, more clearly. So, so I think it's wonderful. What was it? Um, what was it about? What did, what did you discover in that short term team that made you think, yes, I'll, I want to be a, a missionary? Was it um, something you saw? The... Yeah, I, I think it was two things. One is uh, our format was uh, we had teaching every morning for three hours, Bible teaching that had a healthy dose of mission challenge to it. Okay. Uh, so I understood more, much more clearly when I got home the biblical mandate for mission. Right. But then we went out on the streets of uh, Mexico uh, in the afternoons and evenings, and uh, I saw people who uh, were poorer in every way than I'd been. Mm-hmm. Their access to the gospel was more limited. Uh, their physical standards were, you know, way below anything I had ever seen. And um, uh, so God used all those things. Partly was the teaching. Partly was the modeling of some seasoned uh, people who were there leading it. And then part of it was just being exposed to the realities of lost people yeah. uh, who were lost in a in a different way, at least than anything I'd ever been used to seeing. So, if I'm um, a pastor of a church, which actually I am, but if if I if I am I'm trying to identify a long term worker in my church family, sending them on a short term team is a is a good way of testing those waters and lighting those fires in in their life. Yeah, and and I wouldn't be um, I wouldn't be cagey about that with them. I you know I'd be very open with them about that. Hey, yeah. here's what uh, we're thinking. Here's you know and help them think through what am I evaluating? What am I looking for? What are the questions I need to be asking myself and others when I'm there? Just so they they have a lot of intentional uh, you know uh, steps when they're there to uh, to help evaluate that. Yeah. And then obviously the debrief after would be very vital. Even better, send one of your elders or leaders or pastors uh, on the team so they can see them in action and uh, and spot strengths and weaknesses yeah. while they're there. Yeah, yeah, that's great. I mean, it, it's worked. It's worked like that for us. I think in terms of being more proactive about the church calling people to be involved in mission and asking someone to do something short term is an easier thing to start with to then test those waters. Uh, with them yeah. um I, I'm, well. I'm very sorry i'm very steve i'm very committed to the idea that um you know short-term mission shouldn't just be for uh you know the sort of young people or the yeah. less mature people but you know, send your leaders because it it will shape your church's global vision and strengthen your home yeah. uh, effect as well but i think that's really important we don't just sort of offload it to to uh the teenagers of the church and, and expect that to be our church's foreign mission initiative. Yeah. That, that moves us nicely on to talk about some of the weaknesses of short-term teams. So um, I guess I want to ask you, because you're more experienced than me on this, but I want to ask you about missions tourism and, and whether that's a, whether that's a thing, whether short-term teams can just be Western Christians going to have a look kind of in an unhelpful way. Have you seen that? Yeah, sure. Uh, I've hosted them as a missionary. I've sent them as a as a pastoral uh, leader in a church. You know, so I've seen sort of lots of uh, both ends of these things. And um, uh, I think the people who fail uh, are those who are probably known already uh, in the church, the sending church, as being well, sort of borderline people. So a big red flag for me is when the pastor or leader says, "Well, I think it'll be good for them." Well, of course, it will be good for them, but uh, you know, don't hammer out your um, your sort of spiritual crises on the back of some poor fledgling uh, church in a, that's trying to just you know preach the gospel in a tough place. Yeah. So I think that's the case. You know, be a little bit cautious on who you send. Make sure you've tested them. If they don't show up to your training and preparation stuff, you know, that probably says that uh, they're not that serious about it, or they don't have the character to make it happen. Yeah, because it will be difficult there if you haven't seen them sort of serve at all locally. You know, it doesn't have to be great evangelism, but if they're not even willing to set up the chairs at home, uh, you know, maybe they won't be very good uh, when it's hot and humid and they're hungry and the food's not what they're used to. So it's those kinds of things. The other uh, sort of person that can be difficult is um, 
is the one who's looking for something uh, quite spectacular in right. a sense. Sometimes the spectacular does happen, but you know that sort of spiritual romanticism where yeah. once I'm in missions, God's going to use me, you know, like uh, the Apostle Paul, and uh, yeah. you know those things don't tend to be normative, and uh, sometimes those people can be very difficult for the local leaders to lead because they're gracious, they're being hospitable, they don't want to sort of come down too hard on these new yeah. people. But some of those kinds of um, uh, people can be very difficult on, and disruptive to the whole team and the whole ministry, frankly. So I think those are some of the, the weaknesses. And just being realistic about expectations. If you're there as an English week and your job is to speak English and to draw a crowd and to, you know, I, I used to tease one of my Albanian friends. I said, I'll go stand there and look stupid and uh, just be the foreigner that they can come and look at like it's a bit of a circus. And uh, you just preach. Right. And, you know, and frankly, sometimes that's what would happen. You know, I'd, I'd walk around, shake a few hands, meet a few people, uh, say my couple of words of greeting, and then uh, the local guys would take over and, uh, and it'd be fruitful. But, uh, you know, I'm not, you know, too proud to, to be a little bit of bait if that's going to be helpful to spreading the gospel. So I guess just be willing to do anything, anywhere, anytime. And that's the kind of person you look for to send on a short-term team. Yeah. Um, so I, th- I think what I heard you say there was about... Um servant heartedness if i if i don't see that in my local church setting i'm not going to see that in a short term team setting so cuz it is uh I, I could take someone who is timid and and shy who might blossom and flourish in another way but if they're not willing to roll up their sleeves and get stuck in here they're not going to be willing to do that um somewhere else i think i've seen also in missionary hosts just a weariness from having people just come and have a look at what they're doing and um, yeah, with no long-term purpose. So uh, sending short-term teams totally disconnected from any kind of mission strategy um, wearies the hosts and is ultimately pointless for the the long-term mission. Yeah. And that's where your long-term relationship with the, with the, church partner church is so important that you can honestly hear from them hey you know this is just not the right time uh to send us more people please and and that you know you get that level of relationship where they'll be honest with you about that but it's a very excellent point you make the other thing i think we've hinted at already but it might be just worth spelling it out is that um another weakness of short-term teams is if we aim them all at young people so what's the ideal age range is there an ideal age range should we you know who are we who are we looking for in our churches to be involved in these things? You know, uh, I, I don't know that anything's ideal. I had my life changed at 18, you know, I, at our church in, the, in Luton there in the UK. There was a, a, a retired couple initiated a short-term ministry to China, which which ended up in our church making a long-term commitment, sending a missionary there. So, you know, anything from 18 to 80, if you have, have a fuel still in the tank, you know, I would say, but, uh, you know, there's obviously health issues and, and uh, issues of mobility if you're in a very difficult, uh, you know, physical sort of situation. But, uh, you know, in, in general, I, I don't know if there's an ideal age, but you know, having said that, so that means, therefore, don't rule out sort of the midlife people yeah. and don't rule out even retired people who, yeah. of course, in places, uh, some cultures, exa- you know, like the Chinese culture, you know, they're valued. You know, the gray hair is an asset in some cultures and, and uh, they'll get a far, you know, better hearing than, uh, than a bunch of younger people who aren't regarded as possessing wisdom in those cultures. So, yeah, it's, I mean, often in these settings as well, people who've got a, a lifetime of work experience have more to offer in a two, three week team than uh, a teenager uh, in the, in the youth group. I think of uh, a few people I know who gone around the Balkans doing uh, parenting seminars uh, and uh, uh, even got on TV. You know, the local uh, the local TV stations. Are, what you have a, a a British person here who's talking about parenting. Now, this one particular guy I'm thinking was a social worker, so he had a little bit of um, of you know a couple of uh, diplomas to sort of back him up but nice. um you know yeah he talked about raising his children and and his wife came several times and so any kind of things like that and, and those are big door openers to reach all kinds of new people for the churches involved that was the great thing about it it wasn't just about helping uh people in the balkans be better parents but 
it opened the door to those churches for longer term gospel relationships. Great. Um, again, I think we've touched on this, but again, spell it out for us, Brian, because I think uh, another unhelpful thing about short term teams is if I do it as a replacement for long term missions, is um, sending people for short term instead of sending them long term. Is that a is that a weakness? Sure, I would say that's a you know a naivety perhaps of uh, the sending church if they if, if we really think that and you know if we just think ourselves most of the fruit in our churches wherever we're based uh, doesn't come just from somebody you meet and then two weeks later you know they sort of become a believer you're investing in people you have a long term ministry and and the you know like you know. Uh, sometimes they say all mission is local because it just depends where you are at the time. So, you know, to us, it's foreign mission. To them, it's local mission. So if we're augmenting, you know, another church's local mission, that's great. But, you know, learning language, you know, being able to speak a heart language to people, you know, we, we've seen that ourselves. You know, people will say, oh, you know, you're, you know, you're frankly not that great at the language, but we love it that you're hacking around and, uh and, and and you can speak to us and you can understand us. We can share with you how we're feeling in our heart language, not have to put it into yours. Yeah. And, you know, so all those things are obviously important for uh, sharing the gospel. And as we all know, discipleship, and that's what Jesus asked us to do is make disciples. Yeah. You know, that happens through long-term investment in people, knowing them, getting to know their strengths, their weaknesses. They get to understand your weaknesses. Uh, someone put it to me this way once. He said, you know, when you go move to Albania, which we did, you know, sort of nine years ago, uh, he said, they'll see you in weakness. Up till now, you've traveled there for two weeks, three weeks at a time. You're always the man. You're ministering out of strength. You preach, you share, you give your wisdom, you do, you call the meeting. He said, they're going to see you now in your weakness and it's going to transform your ministry. That was very wise insight, actually. Uh, and was that your experience? So, yeah. You know, they would, people would see when we were struggling. They could then minister to us, which of course helps them grow, you know, when they're mm -hmm. ministering to us. Uh, you know, they sometimes had to correct us, challenge me, you know, rebuke me, all those things, which, uh, you know, sort of perversely, uh, so to speak, or bizarrely are, are how they grow, right? They're exercising mm -hmm. the, their ministry in my life. And, uh, and so it, it helps them and, uh, become better, uh, leaders and disciples themselves when they have to do those things. Uh, with me and they just get to see oh brian's got weaknesses uh we have strengths that compensate for those it helps build team and camaraderie and partnership and and all those kinds of things as well great um let's get really practical for a moment what uh what am, what should i do if i'm thinking about running a short-term team as a church leader what's the the first step to take uh practically uh, well, you know, if you have a an existing, you know, partnership or relationship, you know, the first thing I'd do is just to sort of share that with the leaders at the other end and say, you know, we'd love to we'd love to do some things, send some people, give us some some direction about dates and kinds of people and kinds of ministry, those kinds of things. If you don't have one of those, you should call us or somebody like us to uh, to help you uh, work that out. So I would say just make sure it's driven by the missional aspect. Of course, you're going to be thinking, oh, this person, that person would be great to send. And, and it's good to be preaching that. I think that's another parallel thing. You, you need to be preaching and drip feeding into your preaching and teaching and discipleship in the church that global mission is part of the normal yeah. uh, Christian life. And then I would say this, challenge people, ask people. You know, so many people in my uh, previous experience in, in leadership in, in Luton in the UK, uh, they'd be interviewed after they came back. Why did you go? So many would say, oh, because Brian asked me to go. Yeah. I didn't think I had anything to give, but Brian asked me to go. And I thought, oh, okay, if he thinks I can do it. So as a church leader, probably a lot of your people are just waiting for someone to give them that affirmation that says, you know what? Here's what I see in you. Here's what I think you can do. Here's what, how I think you'd be a benefit to the work of God in this yeah. situation, in this context. And that will really, you know, give a lot of boldness and courage to a lot of people who might just be thinking it must be for somebody else, really. Yeah, yeah. And, and when I've done those things, so I, I found a suitable place based on relationships. I've I've asked a group of people to go. Um, how long do I need to plan it? 
Uh, yeah, that, this is, um, you know, we're, uh, we in the West are probably the, the slow ones on this. You know, I find a lot of churches in the receiving end might be willing to make it happen in a much shorter time than we can organize our time yeah. off work and get the funding organized and all those sorts of things. I would say just the minimum time in terms of planning is uh, is partly based on some uh, preparation you ought to do. You know, be sure to get somebody who's got some cross-cultural expertise to uh, just give you some cultural adaptation preparation, not necessarily uh, just about uh, the specific culture only, but just more principles of how to, you know, kind of adapt culturally. So, you know, I think you need a few months, but probably – Coming from the West, you need six or eight months is my typical experience that people tend to need, especially if it's a bigger group, getting it all together. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Thanks, Brian. That's all really helpful. Is there anything else on short-term teams that you think we should we should say or should cover? No, I think I think uh, I think they're great. They can be so helpful uh, in the local context. They can be so destructive, but they don't need to be. And I just think, you know, it's always about expectations. Make sure the expectations of the receiver and those going are lined up. You know, if it's mostly exposure, make sure that's clear. If it's doing a specific task, make sure that's clear. If it's um, if it's to help you find out your future and missions, make sure that's clear. Uh, as long as those expectations are lined up, everybody can have a real wonderful experience and see God do amazing things. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Brian. That's really helpful. Thank you. Thanks.